This next portion of the video will focus on thermoplastic splint fabrication using the steps discussed in the text. The basic steps in splint fabrication include designing the splint, selecting the material to be used, making a pattern, cutting and heating the material, forming the splint, finishing the edges, applying straps, padding, and attachments, and finally evaluating the splint for proper fit and patient comfort. There are many considerations when deciding on the design of a splint. Please refer to your text for questions that will guide your decision-making process. Selecting the proper material is important because it can affect your splint design. Becoming familiar with the properties of various thermoplastics will help you choose the best material based on the needs of the patient and the purpose of the splint. Properties such as rigidity, drape, conformability, memory, and thickness can affect the way a material is handled during fabrication. For example, this Omega Max material has a high degree of rigidity and a low degree of drape, which would make it appropriate for use on a patient with spasticity. In contrast, this Polyflex 2 has a high degree of drape and molds easily around the contours of the hand. Once you have decided on the appropriate splint design and material to be used, you are ready to make a splint pattern. Using a paper towel, you can create a moldable pattern by placing the patient's hand on the paper and marking the anatomical landmarks according to the design being used. Transfer the pattern to the splinting material by tracing it onto the plastic with a wax pencil or an awl. The next step is to cut the splint material to size and heat it in preparation for molding. When using a large piece of splinting material, it is best to cut it down to fit your pattern by scoring it with a utility knife, bending it, and scoring it again from the other side. Next, heat the splinting material by placing it in hot water until it is soft and easily moldable. This usually takes only a minute or two. Remove it from the water with a spatula or tongs. Use a sharp straight edge scissors to cut the material along the traced pattern. Remember to hold the material horizontally while cutting to avoid overstretching it. Before forming the splint on a patient, always check the temperature of the material to ensure the patient's safety and comfort. When using a material with draping qualities, it is best to position the patient so that gravity can assist as the splint is forming. Use smooth and gentle strokes to contour the splint over the arches and bony prominences of the hand. Be sure not to grip or squeeze the thermoplastic as this can cause pressure points. As the splint is forming, it is important to check for any motion that may be unnecessarily restricted and make changes in the splint as needed. It is also important to watch for pressure areas on bony prominences such as the ulnar styloid. You may want to place a small piece of foam or putty over the prominence before splinting. Another option is to push the material out as the splint is cooling to create more space over the bony prominence. While the splint is still on the patient and slightly warm, use your fingernail to mark any edges that will need to be cut away. Cutting the material while still slightly warm will create a nicely finished edge. Smooth edges and proper application of straps are imperative to prevent pressure points and to ensure a properly fitting splint. One way to produce a smooth edge is to dip the edge of the splint into the hot water and cut it while it is still warm. Also, heating the material briefly with a heat gun and smoothing it lightly with fingertip pressure will create a smooth edge. Strap location must be carefully planned to provide three-point pressure. Adhesive hook Velcro is applied directly to the splint. It adheres most effectively when the splint material and the sticky side of the Velcro are spot heated with a heat gun. Depending on the material being used, the surface of the splint may also need to be prepared by using a solvent to remove a non-stick finish or by scoring the plastic with a sharp scissors. Soft brush Velcro or other foam strapping is then used to hold the splint securely on the patient. You may need to pad the splint to enhance wearing tolerance and patient comfort. Be sure to allow extra space over the bony prominences during the molding phase to prevent additional pressure once the padding is applied. When making a dynamic or static progressive splint after the splint base is formed, the next step is to apply the outrigger or any attachments. Outriggers can be custom made by shaping thermoplastic into a tube using prefabricated splint tubing or by bending wire into the desired position. Here the therapist is rolling out a piece of thermoplastic to create a tube shape that can be formed into an outrigger. An outrigger provides a base for positioning a 90 degree angle of pull to the joint that is being mobilized. It is important to line up the outrigger over the joints to be mobilized as it is forming. After the custom outrigger is cooled, it can be attached to the splint base. It is best to prepare the surface of the splint and the outrigger by scoring or applying solvent and heating the surfaces with a heat gun. Once heated, press the surfaces together in the position desired and hold them briefly to ensure adequate bonding. The tension of a dynamic splint is provided by rubber bands, 
coil springs or elastic thread. These can be attached to the splint base with Velcro tabs, hooks, or knobs that are placed proximal to the outrigger. Monofilament or fishing line is attached to the rubber band to create a smooth excursion as it pulls over the outrigger. This can be done using fishing knots or crimpers on the monofilament and attaching the rubber band securely around it. There are also commercially available finger slings that come with monofilament loops attached. The top surface of the outrigger is heated and a groove is made in the splint material that lines up with each finger to be mobilized. This will guide the monofilament as it moves over the outrigger, ensuring the correct direction of pull. The monofilament attaches to a finger sling to provide the appropriate tension to the joint being mobilized. It is critical to ensure a 90 degree angle of pull. This perpendicular force will prevent shearing stress and unwanted traction of the joint. It is important to remember that as mobility improves, the therapist must reevaluate and make changes to the outrigger to maintain the 90 degree angle of pull. There are also several types of commercially available outrigger kits. These are usually applied by drilling or punching holes in the splint base and attaching the outrigger with specially designed thumb screws. After the splint is finished, it is important to evaluate it for proper fit and patient comfort. Have the patient wear the splint for 20 minutes. Then remove the splint and check for any areas of redness or blanching on the skin. This may indicate that there is too much pressure on the area. If the splint has a dynamic component, check to be sure that the angle of pull is correct and the splint base is not being pulled distally by the traction force. Make any changes necessary to ensure the splint is fitting properly. It is also important to educate the patient on proper application and care of the splint to ensure compliance. Use the following questions as a guideline as you complete a final assessment of your splint. Does the splint achieve its purpose? Does the splint maintain the proper position of the joints? Does the splint fit the contours of the hand, the arches, and the bony prominences? Does the splint restrict or immobilize only the joints it is intended to immobilize? Are all edges smooth and all possible pressure points relieved? Can the patient apply and remove the splint? Is the splint cosmetically acceptable to the patient? If you can answer yes to these questions, you can be confident that you have fabricated a splint that will help the patient reach his or her goals.